Bookham, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for investing the next couple of hours of your evening into what promises to be an incredible discussion. Uh, my name's Justin Lee, and I'm going to facilitate and share a discussion this evening with Sandeep Kumar and Samir Patel. Let me do some introductions before we start our session this evening. So many of you may not know who I am. I'm, I'm new to this field of dentistry, but I'm not new to dentistry. I entered the dental world about 31 years ago when I qualified as a dental technician. But more recently, I am the founder of a business called Focus for Growth. And Focus for Growth is a sales and leadership training company that specializes in the dental market. Now, I personally work with a number of really impressive brands and market leading organizations in the dental field, including Align Technology, WNH, the My Smile Network, which is how I've met Sandeep, and a number of other leading brands in the marketplace. And I'm the best selling author of the business book, Inspire, Influence, Sell. And really, the business that I work with is all about bringing business best practice, world class best practice to our clients in the dental market. And who better to join me in that discussion than Sandeep Kumar and Samir Patel? So I'm going to introduce Sandeep and Samir. I've got a couple of slides that I think might be useful as I do that. So I'm just going to share that as I do. So first of all, Sandeep Kumar. Uh, many of you will know Sandeep, but he can only be described as a, as a real trailblazer in the world of Invisalign. And he's one of the UK's leading Invisalign diamond providers and has created more than 4,000 smiles, new smiles with Invisalign in his private clinics. Originally from India, Sandeep came to the UK in 1999 and qualified with the GDC in 2000. And on the lookout for his next opportunity, bought his first practice in just 2003. When he launched his first private dental clinic in 2007, Sandeep recognized the potential in harnessing Invisalign's consumer appeal and the value to differentiate his practice and his offering to patients. He implemented a highly successful lead generation and nurturing process and grew his Invisalign caseload from just seven in his first year to 400 cases in 2015. And by 2016, he had grown to one of the few UK practitioners to have successfully treated over 2,000 patients with Invisalign. Sandeep has built his success around the Invisalign Clear Aligner brand and has inspired and encouraged those around him to do the same. He now owns three successful dental brands, Smile Dental Birmingham, as you can see on the, uh, on the slide here, Smile Stylist and My Smile, which includes the UK's first Invisalign only clinic. He also leads the MySmile Network, made up of a group of 95 independent dental clinics across the country, and the MySmile Academy. He travels around the UK regularly, speaking on the benefits of working with Invisalign and MySmile, or training his network members. He took his vision to a new level this year in 2021, when he co-founded the new brand, the Invisalign-focused dental stores under the Smile brand. You'll see it there in the center of the slide with the three Ms. So look that up if you haven't had the chance to already. Uh, Sandeep lives in Birmingham with his wife and family. He loves Formula One and cricket. I know he also likes football. Uh, and he's a keen cyclist and tennis player. And most evenings he can be found walking in the woods with his dog. So welcome, Sandeep. And thank you for investing your time this evening, Sandeep, with us. Now, let me introduce Samir Patel as well. So Samir, uh, equally impressive uh, story with Samir. So on the acquisition of 11 orthodontics, funnily enough, 11 years ago, Samir has played an instrumental role in transforming a small two surgery single specialty practice into an 18 clinician multidisciplinary practice. That is an incredible change. He has through carefully planned growth and acquisitions, grown it 600% in just nine years. 600% in nine years, That take that in, that's quite incredible. Um, he did this with, as to his own words, many failures and is committed to help people in his network and people that he works with to avoid the same issues. His clinical ethos is all centered around minimally invasive care, 
which he instills into his hand-picked clinicians who work in the practice and alongside him. His leadership, motivation and teamship culture all stems from his sporting background. And Samir's played and captained at county and club level, both home and abroad, with great success, bringing these values into his dental setting and his practice. He's known for his charity work, his partnerships and an annual percentage of profit contributions to Smile Train, Keen, Salvation Army and dental missions to Uganda and India. His willingness to give for the greater good has been recognised amongst his fraternity peers and nationally. And Samir has appeared on Sky News, ITV and is recommended by Tatler, get this, as the go-to dental surgeon in the UK. What, what an incredible thing to be, uh, to be referenced by Tatler. And I love this statement by Samir, who, who says, excellence is a process and not a destination. Excellence is a process, not a destination. And it's the belief that he instills uh, around the teams or in the teams that work around him and in his practice. And they've come to love and know that as a principle. So welcome both. I hope that uh, I hope that introduction did you justice because uh, it really does deserve to. So I'm going to stop sharing the slides now. We're going to go into conversation. I'm going to start with Sandy and just ask Sandy, you I believe you're one of Align Technologies' largest providers of Invisalign. And I'd love to hear from, you know, from this position looking back, having achieved what you've achieved, tell us the kind of key milestones, the key steps that helped you to get to that position. Yeah, first of all, uh, thanks for the amazing introduction, Justin. I, it's better if I don't add anything. I'm, I don't think I can, I can do any better than what you have done. So thank you for that. And okay. you know, it's a real honor to real honor to be here today to you know to be able to share my experience with everybody. So um, yeah, so you know my my journey with Invisalign started in 2007 when I when I certified that that's when I certified with with Invisalign. Came back, never thought much about it. Started my squat uh, private practice that time. Didn't have much going on. It was very early days. Um, came back from the course, um, picked up a couple of cases, spoke to Invisalign team. They helped me to plan those cases and we went ahead. So, you know, I started a couple of cases in 2007. You know, the amazing thing happened when I start to see those cases in about six weeks time when they came in for review. Mm. And, you know, it was just fascinating. It was just amazing to see how happy the patients were, how everything was exactly tracking the way the way it was planned it to be. And, you know, it, I just, just love the simplicity and the whole whole workflow of it. And, you know, looking back, I'm sure, you know, you will and Samir will and all of us, we have this, um, call it a light bulb moment, call it a penny drop moment. You know, it was just one of those moments and I thought, well, this is what I want to do moving forward. And, you know, you, you've been through all my, <laughs> what I'm doing now at the moment and all I can tell you is, Everything I have now has built around Invisalign. And if I can summarize this thing, you know, being the largest provider, being, you know, traveled around the world, speaking on different stages about Invisalign. And I think that's all boils down to one thing, and that is the relentless focus on one thing. Mm. You know, especially in the world of this Instagram, social media, all that, you know, there's a lot of shine, shine, shiny objects. There's a lots of opportunities and people are running after everything what they see. And that's the one thing I've always stick to is, you know, I've never diverted from the tunnel vision. I loved Invisalign since 2007, it's 2021. Every practice I run, every business I run, my small network, including my practices, everything is built around Invisalign. Yes, we do everything else, but the center and the core of everything has been, has been Invisalign. And, you know, we, it, it's, it's that relentless focus has paid off. We did nearly 700 cases in one month in, in March this year. Wow. And, then, <laughs> and you know, the beauty of this is beauty of Invisalign I like is it's, it's the one thing which, in my opinion, in dentistry can be scalable. If you put in infrastructure, if you put systems and processes behind it, you can, you can make it scalable business. And, you know, that's how it all happened. Mm. So, so that relentless focus on a single kind of aspect of dentistry, 
dentistry, a single specialist area. Interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, we're going to come back to this, Sandy. Thank you very much for yeah, the introduction. Lovely. Lovely. E- excellent. Excellent. Uh, just before I go to Samir, if anybody has any questions as we go through uh, our webinar, our discussion this evening, is there anything you want to ask? We are an open book this evening. So do look. There's a there's a button or a, a chat box where it says ask an expert or ask a question please feel free to drop your questions in there for Sandy and Samir this evening, if there's anything specific that you'd like them to cover. But Samir, um, so similar question for you, slightly different. Um, so Samir, I, I love the quote around, the, the Tatler quote is quite incredible. You have built one of the most well-respected boutique practices in the country. Uh, I'd love to hear your view on kind of how you've how you've built that. What, what are the key insights? Um, Justin, first of all, thanks again for, for having me um, and organising all of this behind the scenes. I know there's a little bit of work, so massively appreciate it on, on yeah. Sandy and myself. So um, thanks, first of all. Um, but look, you know, the growth of Eleven, um, the first thing I want to say, actually, from Sandeep's point of view, I don't believe that boutique practices are scalable. And I think if you've got a dentist in there, one person who's in charge of that practice or a group of you, I think it's really tough to keep quality and therefore I don't believe high quality is scalable um, in a dental practice. It is in terms of systems and in, in the terms uh, um, Sandeep's describing, but from a boutique practice, I just believe um, it's very difficult to put yourself in different venues and provide highest quality um, because your vision doesn't is not then tunnel vision. It's actually so scattergunned that you, you'll struggle. So um, look, 11 from very small beginnings, um, Shivani and Anthony were, were orthodontists there. Um, and we actually partnered with Accenture at the beginning when we took over the practice to try and redefine dentistry um, in terms of patient care. Um, what, what is it that dentistry was doing and what were they choosing um, within the dentistry net, um, field? And also, why were people coming back and why did people want to come back and why were people being re- recommended a dentist? And really, we found um, that customer service and dentistry really was not there. Um, when we did all of, well, Accenture did all of the, the sort of background understanding and the customer service wasn't there. It was just transaction um, across the board. And therefore, they, those small things that matter so much mm-hmm. and people buying people was lost even if they were a great bloke, great lady doing dentistry, they were still transacting doing dentistry. So we tried to change that and make it a real cuss. We had four main cores, core values at our practice. And, and really, it was it was driven by patient satisfaction and patient care. So we never call the front desk um, reception team. It was concierge. Um, when they went in the waiting room, there'd be a Sonos player, it'd be very quiet. Um, we had this wonderful sort of thought process that the colors on the website should match the colors and the hues on the walls. So we had elephant breath, pharaoh and ball, same on the website. And that built subliminal trust as soon as they came in. Mm-hmm. Um, and all those small things that were done absolutely in, in other fields um, were now we were going to try them in dentistry. And also we were really lucky because I remember in the first year where we where we hardly broke even, you know, we were lucky, Anthony and myself, we had other practices to sort of lean back on. But there was still a vision that if we did it well and did it correctly and treatment planned holistically in terms of comprehensively, the patient would go away with a pain free experience, um, understand our vision, which was not single tooth dentistry um, and grow our business. Now, obviously, we you know you know if you're treating somebody well they are going to talk about you and i remember one step stage we, we did analysis on every new patient was referring 1.9 new patients within wow. a one year period so really therefore we were doing marketing but it was minimal but the way we took care of these people and you know people by people that there is you know forget everything dentistry is people and we, we transact and we do our work and, and that is critical. And so, look, we, we grew through good customer service and we grew I think, through good dentistry. The team at 11, I mean, I'm just one of 18 clinicians, absolutely right. But they are all award winning clinicians in their own right. And the quality that they produce is, is first rate. And then um, once we were sort of bubbling, we were growing, we actually grew through acquisition. 
So we, we realized we wanted to increase um, one side of our business, which was the periodontal side of things and the implant. And we acquired a periodontal practice. Um, and therefore, we went from a very simple, I think, 80 percent straight through to 94 percent overnight. So you can think that's all probably top line um, in terms of um, profit, because re really your overheads are taken care of. Yes, there's a few more staff come in. But we've done that twice and we've grown through acquisition in, in terms of growth. Um, and that was actually um, a recommendation. Not, not I'm not going to take this one because James Kahn was my first patient in, in London. And he used to come and see him in Henley. He's like, this, forget this. I'm not coming to Henley anymore. You need to open up. So Anthony Shivani had started. I, I then um, took him on as a client. Very kindly, he then sent his Rolodex to me. So all his friends and family all, all then came to me. But wow. really, when we had we won a couple of awards and I said, we're really excited, we'll open a second practice. And he literally cut through it and said, what's your occupancy? And when I said, I think it was 78 percent, he said, you're just going to rob Peter to pay Paul if you open a second business. Get to over 95 percent when you're earning super profits and only do it then. And he said, how long will that take you? And I probably said five to said 10 years. And he said, have you got that? I said, well, yeah. And he said, no, acquire. <laughs> He told me not to, to grow, he, and he said, look, you've got to grow through acquisition. And so um, we took over a periodontal mm -hmm. practice that almost then took us to occupancy. Uh, we put another chair in, and then we extended our hours, and then we went to weekends. And so, look, it's been a constant sort of process for us. But um, as Sandeep said, I've you know, been absolutely single-minded in terms of the quality of care, the quality of service. But also then the growth side of thing is absolutely it's you know it's fundamental to to any business you've got to grow otherwise you plateau and you're mm. going down and and that means everybody feels a little bit labored mm, very good incredible story samir we've got some questions coming in from people who are tuned in at the moment i'll um i'll go to a couple of those because they're interesting uh, samir because you, you're um it's kind of relevant off uh, what you've just said uh, pra uh, practice manager Anna Adams has asked Samir when you say a boutique agency can't grow I, I, you, I think you said scale didn't you um, if you're she says if you're receiving 1.9 referred clients per patient um, what do you do when you get to capacity do you refer elsewhere that's interesting uh, you're just increasing your, your pricing by 10 percent every time Tell us a bit more about that, Samir. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, we had we had some great advice in our growth, and we got to this ninety five percent, and or, or was it just over ninety percent at one stage? And um, we had a business manager who was Cranfield Business School, and he just said, "You guys are really busy." And I mean, I've just had your, my braces. But I had no idea how much braces cost. So he said, "Just you know," he didn't say anything in the whole meeting. And, and Antti and Shimani were looking at me, and he brought this guy along, and. We paid him a lot of money and he's not really said anything. And he said, I just think you should increase your pricing by 10%. So we increased it by 10%. And six months later, we had the board meeting again and he turned up and he didn't say anything. And he just said, what should we do? And he said, did anyone notice? I said, no one noticed. He goes, go again. So we went again, 10%. And then six months later, he said, did anyone notice? I was like, no one noticed. We went 10%. <laughs> <laughs> and then the fourth time, I was like, I, we are not. And we were all looking at it. Right, we were like, yeah, yeah. But we, we went to the clinic. We we're like, we're not going any higher than this. <laughs> and nobody noticed. Occupancy went up from 90 to 95%. It continued to grow. Good mm -hmm. quality, people will pay for. If it's not the quality, you'll get found out. And that's a critical, critical side of this. So mm -hmm. lovely question. But actually, we are in a boom zone for dentistry. And I'd like to know who is actually increasing their prices because everywhere, including fuel prices, are going up when there's a shortage. Mm. So, absolutely. Mm. We will continue to increase our pricing if we get busier and busier. Mm. That's really interesting, uh, Samir. And, and, you know, on one hand, you kind of think that makes so much sense. But on the other, there's, I can imagine a lot of people are reticent because either they think their pricing is already at a level that it should be or they're worried that that will constrain demand but when you've got this demand supply tension like we have in the market at the moment actually and, and you're confident around your quality and the patient experience that's absolutely the right thing to do um so anna said thank you love that using the price to keep capacity under control while improving profits really helps to get to the next level yeah great. yeah and thank you don't you. overload your staff because often what happens is you get so busy you're often overloading your staff at that stage 
And then you get people leave and all of a sudden you drop back. And you're like, what happened there? Yeah. And actually what you want to do is share those profits with, with staff, number one. Um, mm. you, you know, look, I'm not saying financial, uh, however everybody does it, it's very different. And, and I know um, it would be something great to touch on before the end of the webinar. Mm. But yeah. actually sharing that is really important. But actually understanding growth can be managed in many ways. Mm. I like I like that. Profit share and managing growth. Uh, we will come back to that, uh, Samir. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Thanks for the question, Anna. That's that's super. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions from um, Sarah Anders. Uh, one from Sarah Anders for you, uh, Sandeep. So Sarah says she really liked the um, advice you gave on putting systems in place as you started to grow your practice. And as asked specifically, what advice would you offer a practice starting out on trying to improve systems? Where should someone start? So first of all, I think you need to start with your existing team. Mm. Um, sit down with your team, understand what each and every team member's role is in the practice. And as I said, Invisalign can be built around systems and processes. And if right people on right seats can really make a huge difference to the growth of your Invisalign business. So sit down with your team, understand who's doing what, and then identify who is going to be become a, call it like an Invisalign champion. There got to be a one person in the practice who knows everything around it. Mm. And the second thing I think is very, very important before you go out and start spending money with any of the marketing agencies, go as deep as you can and do internal marketing. The pa patients who are coming into your clinic, they are already want what you are offering, but they don't know what you are offering. So figure out a way how you're going to start that communication with your existing patients. You know, all these new uh, softwares can send these automated messages and emails and start to introduce to them what what you're offering before you start start going and doing doing the market yeah. so market to your internal existing loyal patient base because you're going to surface some inquiries and some leads through through your your own captive audience yeah re Absolutely. really good advice Absolutely. really good advice and and in terms of uh, 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 deeper ben patel has asked is there a, an invisalign course you recommend if someone was starting uh sandy so Invisalign, first of all, Invisalign have got their own Invisalign Go course, which you, if you're a GP, that's where you start. Yeah. And that is a very good, it's, it's a, so they used, when I qualified then there was only Invisalign comprehensive courses available that time, but there was a steep learning curve that time. So Invisalign have come up with this Invisalign Go training courses, which are really hand-holding the GPs building their confidence as they go along. And once they have done 10, 20, 30 cases, they can go on to doing uh, comprehensive cases. Okay. And they can do so a you, comprehensive course as well, yes. So you do you do it directly with um, Invisalign and, and Align Technology? That's what I do. Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sandy. That's great. Um, I've, got, I've got some interesting questions coming in. So got somebody, uh, Sarah Kamar has asked, she's been out of dentistry for a couple of years due to family illness and then COVID. Um, she's interested in finding an opportunity to get into Invisalign when private practices aren't keen to take people on due to NHS dentistry background. Uh, having been away for dentistry for two years, she kind of feels uh, that, that she's getting herself up to date, but as she understands it, she needs to be seeing patients to actually do the course and to get the position. Have you got any advice for somebody? I know it's quite a specific question. I wondered if he, if you have any advice specifically for Sarah. Yes, yeah, certainly. I'll take this one if that's okay. Mm. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean, one of the criticals when we're recruiting, you know, anywhere at my practice mm. is to actually have a portfolio and actually photography to be able to show um, a potential employee. Um, to say this is what I can do would be amazing, but also then to show your patience. So I think mentorship is really important. Try and find somebody. Uh, Sandy, I, I know your story, and, and I feel really strongly that mentorship is really important. Um, and so try and find somebody that can help you on that journey, uh, either through supervision of work that they are doing, 
um, but also investing in a, in a camera and photographing your work so you can show people um, your talent and how good you are um, because there's nothing better than somebody that's actually showing you photography and hope, otherwise you're hoping for the best. Yeah, I think it just elevates um, your CV massively. Mm -hmm. That's really good advice, Samir. So, so documenting, photographing successful cases so that you've got, you know, an evidence, a portfolio. And, I, and I've seen yours, Samir, at your practice, and it's absolutely stunning. The, the number of successful cases and examples you've got is uh, is really impressive. Yeah, and that's um, a really important side of, um, you know, when we're treatment planning, though, mm -hmm. because, you know, this whole emotional thing that they've come up, they've Googled you, they've turned it up to your practice, and they've then engaged with you and you've told them, yes, you can have this treatment that they want. Because often they say, look, this is the treatment I want, this is what I want to look like. And you're like, well, this is, these are the steps, this is what we're going to do and we can help you achieve it. What's left? Yeah. It's actually to show a case or five mm -hmm. and try and find a male or a female, whatever they are, at the same um, age as they are and say, look, this is a similar case to you, exactly. This is, mm -hmm. this is somebody of your age. Well, this is something we did and at the end of your Invisalign treatment, we did some whitening bondings and this is what it looks like. How does it look to you? And here's just another case. And by then you've reinforced it so deep that they're actually ready to book an appointment with you mm -hmm. and book the treatment plan up. And actually most of our patients will book the whole series of appointments up with us on the first appointment. Mm. You're so you're, that's so insightful, Samir, because you're right. P patients come to dentists to your practice. They're coming for the result, the outcome they want. They want to know and they want to have confidence that you're going to be able to deliver that. And, and actually a portfolio like that really does give you that opportunity to give the patient confidence as much as anything. Very good. Can and, I just and, add? Can I just add yeah, something here, Justin? Sorry. Please, uh, you know, yeah. I think the the question was, you know, she was working in NHS practice, and you know that, in my opinion, if you work in NHS, use that as a perfect opportunity to learn and experiment and mm -hmm. improve your skills. Because once you go into private practice, and when you start charging whatever you're going to charge for private practice, there's no margin of error. Whereas, you know, NHS practices, you know, say you want to do Invisalign course, Invisalign case, speak to your NHS patient. As long as you cover your cost, learn from it. Start a few cases at a very, very low, low cost. As Samir said, build your portfolio now. Okay, you won't be earning a lot when you're starting out, but invest. It's like, you know, you're going out on a course and investing. So when you come back, you're in NHS practice, it's okay. Do it a little bit cheaper than you will do but build your own portfolio and then eventually that will open a lots of pathways for you to go into a private practice mm. and you, you're building your skills your competence and your portfolio for the future yeah i love that i love that and and something you mentioned as well samir was about finding a mentor uh you, you i know you've both worked with mentors in the past have you got advice on how someone goes about finding someone and approaching them yeah, I mean, I just feel that you've got to find somebody you get on with, you respect, and and take it on from there. Because re really, a mentor, someone that you can ask questions um, that you might feel they're silly, or you just need some reinforcement of, of something, and, and or just go and watch them. I, I remember um, when I first took my um, job, you know, after after my VT, it was a private job, um, but I was so well skilled that I was doing a lot of courses. But I was taking Friday off to go and watch a myriad of dentists, just see how they work, what they do. And um, Sandy makes a great point. I, I don't believe actually financially that's what you're seeking at the beginning of the career. What you're seeking is experience. Mm. What you're seeking is the ability to create a portfolio. What you're seeking is the fact that you, you can get yourself out of problems when, when they arise or just understand, well, that was something I find really difficult. And now I know exactly how to do it. Mm. And so that whole five years first five years is all about just growing yourself and and, and sometimes we do have hiatuses uh, whether it be through through pregnancy or or career change or or just that you, you know whatever life deals us but you've just got to come back and say right what is my plan and i think you've got to have a plan you can't just let it drift and hope for the best mm -hmm. you know i love elon musk's expression you know, i have a five-year plan and i try and knock it out in three months <laughs> absolutely it, you, you know, that's what he does and he goes i'll get 90 percent done in three months and so this is if you say oh i'm hoping for the best i hope that i see somebody and uh somebody will tell me something well that, that's drifting 
If you're so committed in this whole tunnel thing that, you know, Sandeep started, which is such a great analogy, if you are really focused to get this out of NHS or grow yourself, you know, you've got to spend time understanding how the slow hand piece works so you can remove decay well. If you can't do that, well, that's the beginning of dentistry. Cutting a cavity, cutting a prep, whatever it is you're doing, mm -hmm. understanding moisture control, suction, all of those are the basics of dentistry. Then you can grow from there. What does a bridge look like? How, what does a margin look like? Mm -hmm. How's the bite looking? So once you have that basic control, I think then you can move forward. And even through those basic processes, you're going to need some help because not everything's going to be clear. We don't. We definitely don't leave dental school totally understanding everything. No. Very good, Samir. And Sarah's put into the chat. Thank you very much. Great advice. She's very grateful. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Both uh, Sandy and Samir. Thank you, guys. Um, I've got a good question about managing financial multidisciplinary disciplines with the many associates and whether or not you have a model or some guidance on how you share fees or how you would do that. Um, I'd be interested in your views on that, both of you, because I guess you've both um, set those schemes up with with people that work alongside you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, the most important thing is uh, when you're setting up a business, you need to decide what are you setting, what do you want to do? You know, there's nothing right or wrong. If you want to set up a sing single handed practice with one associate, that's absolutely fine. If you want to set up one practice with five associates, that's absolutely fine. But what, what, what I'm seeing is people are not sure what they want to do. So they try and, dip, you know, dip their feet a little bit into this, a little bit into that, a little bit into that. The most important thing is associates are your um, most, I'm not saying the other team is not important, but when it comes to delivery of the clinical work, they are the most important people in the business. Pay them really, really well. The thing is that if you spend time with them, train them, I think, what was it, Richard Branson, he said something, you know, train people so well, that they can leave you, but look after themselves so good that they'll never think about it. It's the same thing. You know, during the lockdown, you know, in, in my multiple practices, all the associates were got paid as they were planned. And none of them were sacked or told that we don't need them. And now, as you know, Samir said, we are in a boom and it's paid off 10 times over because mm -hmm. what that helped is to build a loyalty and they know that, you know, we, we, we stay together as a team. Now, financial model, you know, there's a lots of different models out there. So it's very difficult to go into how you should pay, pay an associate. I think sliding scale work really, really well. Um, start at a decent, decent rate. And then depending on what sort of associates they are, what are they doing, and have them, have them on a sliding scale. But make sure you pay them well. It will pay off in long term. Mm. Yeah, I'll go to the micro side of that as well. And so, look, it's got to be somebody you can get on with as an associate, number one. You've got to get on with your boss uh, because then it really makes life really easy because you have a, a mutual respect from the beginning. Um, and, and that does mean investment in that relationship and understanding that person because everybody wants something different out of it. Um, at 11, all the 18, no, I do not tread on their toes for the style of dentistry that they do or the way that they work. I just asked them for a few ground rules, um, but also sliding scale is, I think, the modern way um, mm -hmm. that a practice with high overheads can be a win-win situation. Absolutely, I think, and I think um, retrospectively, the higher numbers really it was very much in 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 the in the bias of the associate mm -hmm. with, with the sliding scale. But I mean, let's move away from that because I think when you have a team. It's so important the output is monitored because you can say, I hope for the best and I hope my practice does well. But if you don't have clear targets, the number of hours that they've worked, number of output that you're expecting from them, not necessarily pushing, but you're expecting from them, you can then plan for the practice to have a budget for income, for expenditure, and, um, and then for reinvestment in the practice as well. Mm. Otherwise, you're hoping for the best and saying, well, let's hope we make a little bit of money. And then when we've got that money, we'll reinvest. Well, that is yesteryear thinking in dentistry. 
where we were hoping for the best. And I think there is so much now on the finance side of dentistry and the business of dentistry that we can totally understand that modeling is what everybody else does. Mm -hmm. And we've been a bit archaic in the way that we've looked at things in the past. The hourly rate that they output, hours they're working, hours they're, they're not working, downtime in the surgery. I'll give you an example. We have a, a wonderful um, associate at 11 that I, we sort of give her three days and those th and we're completely full. The clinics are full six days a week. And, but whenever there's somebody off, she gets those days. So that allows me to maximize the clinic even further. Now we'll give her her days a month in advance. Say so these are the days we need you. So she's fine. She can plan her, her time and, and, and whatever she has to do, but that fills any gaps. But it's very clear that if someone is taking a lot of time off and there's downtime in the surgery, well, that's going to affect the output of the practice as well. Mm. And, and therefore, we want to be as efficient as possible when we run a practice because there's, there's three hats. You know, the e writes so beautifully. Well, there's a technician, which is us as dentists. There's a manager where we're trying to actually keep up with everything. And there's the entrepreneur. Now, the manager has actually got to integrate the understanding of the business vision. The entrepreneur will come up with something and the entrepreneurs, and I know it, we haven't got the ability to actually do that macro st micro stuff. So you've got to have a great practice manager or some type of integrator that can then say, right, okay, that's what we want to try and do. That's the profit margin. This is the hours that we're going to try and work. How do we fill those gaps? How do we maximize our time and the surgery is open? Because it's when you maximize them is actually when the practice makes the most profits, um, which therefore can lead to better investment and better pay and, everything that comes with that. Mm. So you, you, you mean similar principles from both of you, you're talking about sliding scales and performance related pay. So you're, you're linking the performance of the clinician or the team to the pay that they can then generate for themselves almost because they know the model and modeling rates getting really clear on you know, utilization in the practice so that you've got money to be able to reinvest that benefits everybody patients the team yourself the business yeah you know, sure. i mean it, interesting isn't it because as you said uh samir you know perhaps not traditional thinking in terms of dentistry but actually quite well established thinking in terms of business and thinking about the practice of the business yeah if, if you are a principal and you don't know the hourly rates of all your clinicians i i, I think that's the that's the first place to start Great and advice. then go back and track it for the year that's gone and say, well, okay, this is the average. And so we know exactly what happens. And therefore, you can do forecasts. What marketing do you want to put in? What type of work are they doing? Um, insight into tracking really allows you to then understand your practice, which allows you to grow even further. Mm. Very good. And, and I guess links up with your other point, Samir, which was set goals around your business decide what numbers you want to achieve, whether they be revenue numbers, patient numbers, hourly rates, utilization, but know what know those numbers so that you can you you can share it with the team and have a target that you can all work towards. Totally. And I have leaders all around the practice and I think that's mm. the best way to be. So you know we have a treatment coordinator, we have a new patient coordinator, we have a reception lead, we've got a practicing manager, a marketing director. So everybody has to send me an email on a Friday afternoon and say, can you just tell me where we're at? It summarizes their week. I know exactly where we're at and therefore moving forward, um, if there's anything we need to tinker with, we can tinker with. Great idea. So that's every Friday afternoon. Uh, is it an, an email, Samir? Is it's it an email. Is it really and, you, know, you know, again, we just don't want chunky emails. We need bullet points. That's it. I don't want to burden them. Bullet points. Mm. Friday afternoon, please. Tell me where we're at. Nice. It forces their focus as well, though, right? Because yeah, they tell me what they're doing next week as well, which I love. Yeah, it's great. Re I really like that. I really like that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, guys, so I, I've got um, some questions that we were planning to walk through uh, this evening. We, I think we've probably started to um, answer some of them anyway, but I'll, let me have a look at uh, some of the key points that I think are going to be useful for people listening in. Um, I, we, we are talking about the business of dentistry. You've already started to talk about how you see your dentistry as a business which is so important i think it, it's one of the key factors that's driven success for you both from what i can tell what what where we are now in terms of you know, the economic cycle where we are in terms of the dental marketplace what i'd be interested in your perspective on why 
thinking about dentistry as a business is more important now than ever. Sandy, what do, what do we start with you? <laughs> yeah, so um, what has changed is this. Uh, you know, I started with Invisalign in 2007, as I said, and I remember early days. There was mixing everything with the hand and with the putty and taking all these impressions and sending everything off and everything was just so time consuming and what i think has shifted in the last 10 years and i remember those days we used to write our notes on a paper on a, on a paper notes um, and what i have noticed in the last 10 years is the digitization of the dental practices has gone to a completely different level. And people who are not keeping pace, and I'm not talking about you know, the, the dental software or the marketing, I'm talking about communication channels. How are you communicating with your patients? How are you communicating with your potential, potential patients or the patients who have already started treatment with you? How are you keeping up with them communication wise when the treatment is finished so how you how you using technology as your as your servant in a way and do lots of stuff which you had to do which you had to do manually um, any body who is even half sincere and thinking about to get on the journey of invisalign you know i can't even count how many eye tele scanners i have in my business but that is a completely no brainer I had a machine is just not a, you know, I'm not trying to sell anything on behalf of a line here if that sounds like it. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a communication tool. If you think about that scanner is a communication tool, the picture says 100 words and that is a video. It's going to even different level. Invest in technology. And I was reluctant when I just initially started out. But now, you know, we are fully digitalized from the way we do our marketing, the way we do online booking, the way we take deposits, the way we send reminders, the patients comes in, how they sign the consent forms, how they sign the medical history forms, how do we, how do we sign the consent, form, uh, consent forms when they're ready to start the treatment, finance, everything is old. We're using the technology to really build around. Now, if you think about this, what that has done is that has, release a lot of time from the team so the team is focusing on customer service you know you can you can build as much technology as you want in any business but you, that personal touch you know when the patient walks into your clinic that has so what's happened is you know let, let's have a look at example of Birmingham there is a at least 50 dentists are offering Invisalign in about five miles radius why people will come to me Mm. It's a very simple question. If you start with that, you'll never go wrong. Why you're so special? Why you're so different? Why somebody's going to going to come to you? Yes, I've, I've mentioned about technology. You're giving them a great experience, but that personal touch, the personal welcome, the personal service which you provide is 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 that's going to ultimately decide are they going to have have treatment with you or or uh, or with somebody else. So that's the digital, I think going, going digital is one of the most important thing has changed in my opinion. Mm. And the second one is, you know, there used to be a time when I used to work as a dentist, I'll be doing all the treatment, I will be doing the x-rays, I will be doing the scans, I'll be writing all the notes. Now it's completely changed. Use your team, use your people in your business and let them help support you and empower them to be part of the team. So now the patient comes in, welcomed by the team at the front desk. The treatment coordinator explains everything to them, make sure they answer all their questions with them, talk about finance and Invisalign and all that. Now the patient has gone to see the dentist. We've got radiograph trained nurses. We've got the nurses who can train, take photographs. They can do the scan. We, we work with a treatment planning service who takes care of all of our clean check needs. So you can see the whole thing. There's a, lots mm -hmm. of people have become a part of that patient journey now instead of, oh, it's only a dentist. The patient is going to come and see a dentist. 
So in my opinion, these two things, it's the digitization and building the business based on systems and processes and empowering your team <clears throat> to be really part of this. And they feel as excited as you are running a business. Mm -hmm. As Samir mentioned very briefly, you know, having a TCO is a leader in the business. She is running a department. She is responsible for sales at the end of the month. The dentists are responsible for the clinical delivery. The new patient coordinator is responsible for converting those leads into, into inquiries. So everybody and practice manager has got a very, very key role to play to make sure the business runs smoothly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the business is about team now. It's all about people. It, it, I'm sure it's always been, but right now, delegate, 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 mm -hmm. and let them run with it. And, you know, the more you do it, I think, you know, the, because, you know, in the network, as, as you mentioned at the start, we got about 95 practices who work with me and dentists reach out to me and say, you know, how do you do that? And this is exactly the same way, delegate and make sure that, you know, mistakes will happen. They will make things, things will go wrong, but make sure that, you know, you learn from it and you have your back, they, you have, you got to make sure that you have your team members back if they mess up something. And mm -hmm. that's how you build confidence. That's how you empower them. That's why you tell them it's okay. You know, things do go wrong. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think these are the two fundamental changes in the last 10 years I have noticed in, in my business. Very, very, very good, uh, Sandy. Thank you. And, and I guess one of the consequences of, of that approach you've just described, systems make sure that everybody's clear what's expected and gives you that consistency in the business. And by getting the team involved, the clinician, the dentist, the specialist can really maximize where they focus their energy and their efforts. And they're doing the work that's most valuable to the practice. Yeah, so absolutely. everybody wins. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's really good. Well really good. Thank you. So, Samir, I'd love to hear your, your view on this. Yeah, I, th I think the business of dentistry has always been there, you, 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 you know, um, but we've chosen not. <laughs> it's been a bit naughty to talk about it. And actually, it's okay to talk about it. I think historically, it used to be the business of dentistry, you're selling and all the rest of it. Whereas actually, you know, you realize that um, it's an important part of it, actually, because we do suffer from, you know, mental difficulties. And we, we do put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And we do need time out of the practice to manage it. Because you can't just do dentistry as well as manage the business, as well as be a good dad and, you know, all the things that you want to do. And I think, you know, the point that Sandy makes is such a good one, but really I'll summarize it by saying leverage everything you've got. Leverage your time by delegating, by appointing people to do the stuff. Delegate your brand so it can then, people can see it across the board and you can leverage your brand by sending internal referrals, um, social media posts, whatever it is that you're doing, you can leverage that. You can, you should be leveraging your money as well because some of the money you make, you should be investing, not only in the practice, but for your own good. Because if you want to stop trading your time for money, you will not do that unless you start investing early into the right things or in something to allow you to have financial freedom when you're older. And so all of this, all of that side of the leverage is critical, whether it be time, brand, money, um, you, you, your own personal space to be able to do stuff. And actually what you'll find is, I mean, talking from a leader's point of view, um, it is that actually your staff love it because you're not on their back. You've leveraged it. You've given them the know-how. This is what I want you to do. This is very clear. This, he said, this is what I'm expecting you to do. And have a no blame culture. And it sounds like Sandy, you've got the same as us because, you know, we don't have a blame culture. If something goes wrong, we want to bring it up. And we have, we talk about a black box moments that the first thing we talk about, any black box moments yesterday. So if one thing goes wrong for somebody, it doesn't go wrong for the six receptionists. They're like, ah, oh, I didn't know that. We don't do that. Okay, that's great. So then, therefore, is another problem that might come up the following week or later on. To say, actually, you know, what did we get wrong? So I think the sharing side of things, whether it be within your business, and the thing that I love about, um, um, you, you know, one of the real beauties about COVID is that us dentists have learned to share more as well. And we've learned to be collaborative. Uh, and, and I love that. I think we used to sit in our rooms, in our dentist chairs, 
thinking we're the men and that's it we're doing it and the women and you know we're, uh, we don't need to talk to anybody i know what i'm doing and you know I, I think the collaboration that we needed to get through covid has been amazing and the openness and the humility um and, and the brotherhood and sisterhood that we found in that um has been incredible because i think in the 25 years of industry actually in the last year I've heard from more people reaching out or I've reached out. It just feels like norm to reach out. Mm. And actually it's it, therefore, you, you know, we're sharing a problem and therefore it's not a problem. And you, you know, mm. Sandeep and I talk regularly o- about uh, things that we're thinking about or, or worried about. And you, you know, that isn't that, I mean, yeah, we would see each other cricket actually from time to time, but this is lovely. I, you know, I think this is, it's, we're in a great place and, and the more we can do it, I think dentistry can only get stronger um, mm. in this country. And obviously, what's so the do, do, do you remember that uh, seven o'clock in the morning call when we both happened to be on a clubhouse? I mean, what that you just, just happened got to six thirty and seven thirty. If you're not <laughs> up at six thirty, I mean, like we're all up, we're doing something. Like that's the only time we get to speak to you at a seven o'clock call. What are you doing? I'm jumping on. <laughs> I'm on my way to London. I'm, I'm jump, jumping on my treadmill. Well, I love that. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> That was seven o'clock in the morning, and tonight we're seven o'clock in the evening. Wow, look yeah, at that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you guys are committed. I'll give you that. that that's brilliant. I, I love that as well, Samir. I love this, the, you know, the idea of delegating to leverage, delegating to leverage. You, As you said, your team are empowered by it and actually enjoy the additional responsibility. But when you think about it, if you're building a practice, if you're trying to build something, you know, that's, that's good for patients, good for you as a business owner, good for your team, Actually, the more people you have enrolled in that vision, this is where we're headed, this is what we need, and here's how you play a part and get their their complete, total and authentic buy-in, all of a sudden you've got three or four, or depending on the size of the practice, you know, 10, 15 people all trying to achieve that goal alongside you. And that gives you so much additional leverage. You're absolutely right. I love, I love that term leverage. It's brilliant. Really, really good. Um, guys, we have... Two questions that are very similar from two different um, uh, viewers. So I'm just going to ask, uh, I'll ask them both. I think they're, they're both the similar questions. So we've got Jacob Koshery and Ivy Glavi. They've asked, uh, the fir- first question was, I'd like to know if, if now is a good time to start a squat practice. And if so, could the speakers give some advice on key points to look into starting one? Uh, Ivy's question is, do you have any tips for anyone starting a squat private practice, the do's and don'ts? So if we kind of say, is do you think now's a good time? Uh, obviously, you guys are in a different position, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then if now is a good time, then, you know, do's and don'ts and tips for starting. That'd be great. Shall we start with Sandy? Yeah, well, I'll take this and I can take an hour yeah, I'm going to just go and kip on the bed just while I turn the ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I, I have done this seven times. So my first practice was the only ever practice which I bought. Everything else has been built from from scratch. Wow! And there's a couple of pointers I can tell you. The most important one is I'm sure you may have heard about it, but there's only one rule when you're starting a squad, and that is a location location, location. Mm. You get that right, you've got a very good chance of succeeding and everything else comes after. And I've only and got I'm one tip you, in this, Andy, if I can just come in, is Waitrose do 10 million pounds of market research for people who have disposable income. And then they put a, a Waitrose in there. Now, what are we in the market for? DI. Yeah. <laughs> So we, I've not got ten million pounds to, to, to market research, and all of the practices I've worked in or own are near a Waitrose. Wow! Yeah, no, I think that that's a very that's a very very good tip. It's just you know, mm-hmm. the thing is that you know, I'm telling you with my experience, I I messed this up very badly, and I opened a my you know things were lo- looking really well. I opened three squads; they all were doing really well, and I just opened another one. And I got the location completely wrong. I was doing everything exactly the same, no difference, same setup, same everything, but the location was completely wrong. Within 18 months, I had to close that. And a number of people I know who have been in this situation. So initially, you know, take some years advice. You can't go wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, take, take your time, take your time. And, you know, this is where 
work with mentors, it will pay off. So, you know, there, there, are, there are people who've been in the industry. They have been through this, this treadmill. They've been through this grind. They've got a lot of experience. They have succeeded. They have failed multiple times. Find a mentor who you can pick up a phone, who have been through this journey. Don't go out there and do it by yourself. Mm-hmm. Spending a little bit and spending some time with the mentor will pay off in long, long run. Mm-hmm. Um, again, before so is the best time to score. Always is the, is the best time to score it and to practice. I do not have any concerns, any issues. I'm just opening one in uh, Bristol at the moment, which is going live in a few weeks' time. We opened one at the start of this year in Newcastle. So yeah, squats are working absolutely yeah. fine. Uh, once you have get that, then the so then say let's just assume that I'm just going to put a figure. Uh, let's assume a figure of ten thousand pounds that you've got 10,000 pounds to spend, what you will do with that. If it is my money, this is what I'll do. I'll, first of all, I will invest in people. I'll hire and I'll train my people really, really well. They need to understand what this business is going to be about. What are we trying to build? What is the expectations? What the end game looks like, maybe in a year or two years or three years down. Once you have nailed that, then the remaining out of 10,000, I don't know how much you're going to left that time, I'll invest in technology. I'll invest in technology so it makes your life and your team's life and your customer experience as good as you can make it. And then if you're lucky and if you still got some money left, that's when you start thinking about investing in marketing. When you're starting squat, you have to have a marketing budget. I'm not saying that you know, don't have it. But if out of the 10,000, if you go and spend 7,000 in marketing and you don't have right people and you don't have right technology, that's going to dry up really, really quick, guys. Mm. So in, invest in the infrastructure. Start with small. You know, you don't have to open a six surgery practice straight away if you're not sure. Start with two surgery, but make sure that you've got, a, you've got enough space to expand if you want to. Then bring the right people. Make sure they share the same vision. Make sure they know where you're going, then invest in technology, and then go out there and uh, and market. And when it comes to marketing, all I say is maximize Google before you go anywhere near anything. You know, there are lots of uh, there's a lots of dentists who have done extremely well on social medias and Instagrams. And you know, if you can follow their footsteps, there's there's nothing better than that. There's a lot to be learned out there. But if you invest in your hard cash. I would invest into Google because the difference between Google and social is if you know what's happening is when you go to Google and you type something, say Invisalign Birmingham, you actually thought about having Invisalign and now you're sitting down on your PC or your mobile phone and you're typing what you're looking for. This means you are interested, this means you're serious and whoever is there, you will reach out to them. Whereas in social media is all the marketers and include me, what we're doing is we're interrupting people's life. You know, when they're scrolling up and down on their Facebooks and Instagram, what we're doing is we are interrupting people's life. Some will like it, some won't. Mm-hmm. Maximize Google first and then become mastery, mastery, of, uh, mastery of marketing. And the most important thing is when you're starting a squad, once you've done all that, you've got to, you've got to become a bit business-minded. Mm-hmm. I know we all qualify as clinician and we all, all want to think about, you know, the mouth and the teeth and everything. But when you're running a squad, you've got to have a pulse of your, you've got to spend time improving your clinical knowledge, your communication knowledge, your sales tech, your sales technology, your sales techniques. And the most important thing is your team. You, 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 you need to build the infrastructure where your team is really bought into your vision. And that, that's, mm-hmm. what, uh, that's what will make you successful. Some great advice there, uh, Sandy. Thank you. Very, very good. Uh, S- Samir, ha- ha- what are your thoughts on this? Um, look, I, th- I think when the, the actual pricing of dental practice is quite high at the moment. Mm-hmm. And so, therefore, that allows the squat option to be a really viable option. Mm-hmm. And if you think the average price of a practice, uh, let's say half a million, Half a million is a lot of marketing. <laughs> mm, that's true. Yeah. 
Very and true. so let's say you set it up and and you invest in the over but then you're paying that off that's a you know that's capital expenditure but you've got a lot of time and money and to set correct systems in the beginning if you set up a squat you've got no bad habits you've got no bad staff mm. uh, that there are but you have no drip income to start with as well so you've got to you've got to absolutely have a little bit of um, strength and belief that it will be okay because you're doing the right thing very good uh, and it's interesting i heard um it was, i was listening to an article recently a podcast and there were some stats mentioned on there about the number of practices that sell in a, in an average calendar year i think the number was about 1500 and then they talked about the number of uh, demands and inquiries for uh, purchasing practices at the moment. And it's something like four times the number of practices that sell in a year. So there's about five, about five, five and a half thousand people looking to buy, dentists looking to buy, and only about 1,500 sell throughout an annual period. So it's so there's a huge disconnect in supply and demand, which kind of, to your point, Samir, says, actually, if you're starting a squat, you should be able to, you know, monetize that quite quickly, set up a successful practice, but you've got to get the other component pieces in place quite quickly. Very good. Very good. Can I, I just like add uh, just two little things here, Justin, which came to mm. my mind? I think, you know, again, I just want to make sure that I share my experience. Whatever your initial budget is, make sure you have at least 20% on top of that. Don't think that it's going to cost you £200,000 to set up a dental practice, and as long as you got a loan, you run away with that. I'm telling you, things never go according to plan. Mm. And the last thing you want to do is being under financial pressure from word go. You will always be worried about where, where you're going, you know, with the builders and equipments. There will always be all these things go wrong. So make sure you cover yourself. And the second, if you really want today, you know, to go away and tomorrow start thinking about it, let me try and sell you why squat is the best best way. Just assume that you spent 400000 setting up a four-surgery dental practice. You set it up, all you go. It is going to be painful. I'm not trying to suggest that it won't be. But you go out there and start running a business in three years' time. If, say, you know, if you get everything right, you've spent all the money, and you make 200000 profit in year three, your business at that time worth $1.4 million. Because dental practices, private practices are selling out there at seven times of EBITDA minimum. If it's a good, well-run practice. Now think about this. You're spending 400000 today. Maybe another 100000 you will need to make sure that you keep the running. But in three years down the line, you have built a business for $1.4 million. So have a long-term plan. Don't just go into, oh, it's a lot of cost. It's never a cost. It's always an investment. And if you if you plan and if you put the structure around it, it will pay off. But make sure that you you get your planning correctly. And again, I will reinforce again: get a mentor. Mm, very good. You starting out your first practice, make sure you got a you got somebody to advise you on the journey. Yeah, and you know it's so important because there are so many people that have have, have already achieved what you're looking to achieve. If you can, if you can get yourself a mentor that's already walked the path, you're going to save yourself a lot of pain, a lot of struggle, and, and figuring out a lot of problems that perhaps aren't aren't as obvious as you think to solve. We've got some great engagement on the chat tonight, gents. Uh, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know. Uh, Michael Donalds uh, said, just wanted to comment that he's definitely feeling the boom. Don't think I've ever been so busy with private patients. Uh, he is interested to know how long the boom, how long we think the boom will last. Is there? an unlikely threat of an updated NHS contract in the wings, he says. Uh, we'll come to that in, in a second. Um, and Anna Adams says, thanks so much for the Waitrose tip. That's brilliant lateral thinking, Samir. She loves that. Uh, so thanks. She says she might have to settle for Marks and Spencers, though. Perhaps she doesn't got a Waitrose near her. <laughs> but uh, sounds like that might, that might work. And Ivy said, love the answer to the questions. Will you be my mentor, please? I'm happy to use Zoom. I don't, I'm not going to press you to answer on that one, guys. But, uh, but Ivy, thank you. Uh, I'm sure uh, Samir and Sandeep are both very flattered by that. Um, uh, Angela has asked Angela all out because uh, actually it sounds like we've answered Angela's first question, which was about if you were going to start your businesses again, what would you do differently? I think you'd already you've already answered some really good points on that about structure, systems, getting the staff in place, technology, investments. 
um, and we've talked about that at squat. So thank you for that. You've, uh, Angela, you were you were obviously on the same wavelength as our discussion, which is great. Um, so Angela's now said, uh, what are your top three tips to be a successful leader? That, I'd like, actually, that's on my list. So Angela, thank you. You are a mind reader this evening. Um, why don't we start with Samir this time? Samir, top three tips to be a successful leader. Give a share. All right. Um, consistency. Uh, consistency across the board with everybody and, and literally stay stable the whole time. I think it's really, really important that you are seen as a constant figure and, and you are consistently fair with everybody, number one. Yeah. Uh, number two, I, I think um, a culture setter, an outline, this is where we're headed or this is what we look like, this is what we do. Um, and if you do that, people will end up either following you or not following you. And the people that don't follow you, you let them go. And the people that follow you, you don't drag them and it's not harming your energy at all. So I would say culture would be number two. Um, and number three, I would say just share good times and bad times because there will be good times and there'll obviously be difficult times as well. And I think um, if things are going well for you, I think it's really fair to share those good times and enjoy them with the staff. Um, and when things aren't so good, I think um, Sandy mentioned earlier, pay, um, your staff or your associates will rally around you because you were there for them in, in the good times. And, and, and I think, um, but consistency is a big thing. Culture is a big thing um, and, and finding fairness. I, lo I love that. You. Love that. Thank you. Great, great question, Angela. Thank you. And uh, great answer, Samir. So consistency, culture and being open and sharing that culture and really getting people on board so they can follow if they want to follow, not and, and don't if they don't, and then sharing everything, good times, bad times, that kind of openness so that everybody knows where they stand. I love that. Thanks. Thanks, Samir. Uh, so Sandy, top three tips or principles on leadership. So what did it take to be a successful leader? Um, so, you know, my, my three will be, I, every time you're going to ask me a question, and my answer is going to be all about people. If you want to build a business, you can't do this by yourself. You have to build a high performance team who share your values, who share your vision, and just help each other to grow together. You know, I think I can sit across the table with six of my people and probably all five of them are smarter than me in one way or other. Know your strengths and weaknesses and surround your people, surround yourself with people who can complement your weaknesses. Mm. And number one, and the number two for me would be, you know, when you're a leader, it's just not a because you are, you know, because you are the boss. What leadership for me is, is about decisiveness. What your team is looking at in a difficult time is somebody to stand up and make a decision. And you need to, yes, you know, you sit down with your team, you analyze the whole situation, you know where you are, but once you have understood, then, you know, just walk away for a day or so, think about everything and be very decisive that team, this is where we're going, that's the direction we're going. And that's what I have noticed in, in you know, speaking to lots of people. Yeah, you know, maybe a little bit this, maybe a little bit, bit that, you've got to have a clear direction. And when you're making it a decision, be prepared that 50% of the time that decision will be wrong. Mm -hmm. So if you go with that approach that every decision you're going to make is not going to be right, but be prepared and tell your team that, you know, this is how we're going to do it. And finally, you know, leaders, leaders have to be a risk taker. There, there, I don't think there is anything I've ever done in my professional life. There was not a element of risk involved. I'm talking about setting up, you know, squad practice, uh, practice. I'm talking about when I jumped into all guns blazing, setting up for Invisalign only dental practice. First one to do, do it in Europe that time, right? Everybody was thinking, are you crazy? Um, just, just, you know, don't put, put all your eggs in one basket. You know, make sure your family is safe, your kids are safe. But you've got to have that element of being decisive and being able, being ready to take take those risks whenever whenever they're necessary. So yeah, that's my three. Wow. So so surround yourself with people that have complementary strengths to yourself. I love I love that, Sandy. Build a team of people who have complementary strengths or or fill your gaps, I guess. 
Um, be decisive, stand up and, and recognize that you might not always make the, the right decision, but you've got to make a decision. So lean into decision making and take risks, because as you say, as the as the leader of the business, if you don't take risks, then people around you won't take risks. It's actually, it's, it's about role modeling as much as anything else as well. Very good. Very good. Thank you both. Um, I, I'll go back to some comments. So uh, Jakob said, thanks so much for the advice. He really, really appreciates it. So thank you both. Excellent. Um, and actually, Laurie Glover, who is our uh, marketing director from FMC, who's on uh, our call this evening and helping us with monitoring in the background. So thank you, Laurie. Uh, Laurie says, uh, absolutely echo Sandeep's advice on focusing on in-market traffic through Google search optimization. Many practices can overlook organic search on their website in favor of social media. Uh, and, and if they do that, they do so at their peril. So just a reminder uh, of the importance of that kind of almost live Google search optimization is really important. Thank you, Laurie. Um, so I, I've got a question here. I'll have to ask it. Um, Irina Sabu says, uh, "Can, in your opinion, guys, do you think can an outdated paper-based practice that's been run by the same dentist for the last 30 years be turned around easily? And if you, and if so, have you got any tips, please? That's uh, it's almost that sounds like you know one of those." Um, uh, newspaper columns, isn't it? Like a, a cry for help, Irina. I'm sorry about that, but we'll we will do our best to help you. Yeah, Justin, you should get one of those pro. You know those programs where they go in and turn around the house. <laughs> right? yeah. We need to do that, right? We've got to get five practices, right? FMC are going to sponsor it. We're going to go in there. We're going to put in digital. We're going to itero scan everybody. I love <laughs> DIY SOS dental. Let's do it. <laughs> Love that, Samir. I love that. Well, well, let's pick this up with Laurie afterwards. Um, I'll just have three tips on that. You know, Thank any, you. any planning for future growth, break it down into six monthly or three monthly sections. Yeah. What is it we are planning on doing? I mean, look, if you, you don't climb a mountain, you climb hills, right? So, what we're going to do, we're going to just take three things we're going to change in the next six months. Everybody's capable of doing this. What are we going to do? Pick those three things. And then on the back of those three things, put three action points that will start the ball rolling for those three action for those three things. That is what I would suggest. Yeah. Great, great advice, Samir. Great. I love that. When you don't climb a mountain, you climb a succession of hills. So, so important to remember. Otherwise, you become overwhelmed at the task at hand. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sandy. Um, so I think there was a couple of years ago, I watched this uh, TED talk and I learned something from that. And that's called OKR's principle. Mm. You know, people talk about setting goals and missions and this and that. And I think that was a very simplified version of all this I've ever heard. So O stands for objective. Now, the question is, you want to convert that paper-based practice to a digital practice. And if that's what you want to do, sit down and write it down. Why do you want to do it? And once you got that why right, you sit down with your team and say, guys, this is where we are now. This is where I want you to take to. What do you think? And when you, as a, as a leader, what you are, you are selling a dream. We are a salesman. You know, I'm selling my vision to my team, to my customers, my, my people. You've got to sell that vision to your team. You cannot do this by yourself. And once your team is bought into it, they can see right. You know how, how their life is going to be easier once the practice is digital or digitized. They don't have to sit there every evening at the end of the day, you know, filing these cards, getting them ready. And they, once you explain to them the benefits and outcomes and why you are doing it, that's when it will sell. And KR stands for key results. And I love that, Samir, you know, you just mentioned whatever you want. So your objective is turn that practice into digital in 12 months. Your team has said, yes, let's do it. Now break this down into quarterly chunks. My brain does not function anything more than a quarter. Oh, the max I can see is a quarter ahead. Mm -hmm. So if you break it down right now, that's this quarter we're going to change the computer systems and we're going to integrate whatever. Then next quarter could be changing the telephone system. Next quarter could be 
introducing the eye terror scanners or some sort of patient management software. Mm -hmm. If you break that down into a bite-sized chunks, it will be easy for you to implement and your team will, will love you for it because otherwise they're going to think every day you're coming up with the, with crazy ideas. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, very good. I, I love, there. Are, there's a couple of things in there, Sandy. The, the first is around being clear on what it is you want. So if it is, you know, set that goal, we're going to move to, you know, a paperless practice or with digitizing records or putting in a patient management system, whatever it is, decide on the goal, sit down and talk to your team, explain what you want to achieve and why you want to achieve it and the benefits for them, the patients, you, the practice, then break it down into those manageable kind of hills instead of the mountain. I, I love that. Some really practical straightforward advice stuff that isn't always at the front of people's minds so thank you both very much it's it's kind of clear the way you think about you know your practices as your businesses and and the kind of tasks at hand very good um and angela says uh, uh, ace advice samir and sandy thank you so much for sharing uh, thank you for the questions angela very good um laurie from uh, fmc says he's in for the tv show so watch this space <laughs> we're going to pick <laughs> it up afterwards um, be mad <laughs> it, 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 I think he has gone mad. I don't know if he's drinking this evening, but he may, he may regret it. Let's do it. <laughs> I think we should do it. Um, so uh, Nish, Nisha Ari says, Samir, does a waitrose in the local petrol station count? <laughs> <laughs> Nisha, yeah. you're so funny. I went to university with Nisha. You are so funny. <laughs> um, you are absolutely brilliant. Yes, it does count because they've done market research. So <laughs> it means that, that there is some people around there, maybe not as many, but get in there. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, and, and Nisha then says, on a serious note, this has been a super webinar. Thank you so much. So that's that's great. Thank you, Nisha. Love that. Love that comment. Um, and uh, let's have a look. We've got a we've got a couple of other comments. Peter Kim says, uh, obviously, it's not an overnight success and required a lot of hard work along the way. But I dare say, perhaps a bit of luck as well. Um, what advice do you have for younger clinicians who are at the start of their practice ownership journey? I think you've covered a lot of content this evening that is going to be relevant. But I don't know if there is for that's for Peter, young young dentists at the start of their practice ownership journey. Anything anything you haven't already mentioned? Um, yeah, look, I, I'll just quickly say, you know, I, I run an elite dental leaders course uh, mm. and um, it, it's over four modules that talks a little bit about number one module, which is a two day course. They're all two day modules um, about leadership. Um, and that's really important. And finding your true north, um, understanding who you are, where you want to go. Um, a lot of the stuff we, we've spoken about and um, Harvard Business School mentors run that. Um, and so the second part is all about your own brand. Um, and so we talk a lot about Eleven and the way we've done our brand. And it's not the leverage of the brand, which is so important. So it's not you, um, but also you are a brand in yourself as well. Um, and then we always talk about teamship in that as well. And we have Sir Clive Woodward, um, who's mm -hmm. England's World Cup winning uh, manager, talking about teamship, how you actually talk about all the things that Sandy was spoken about, you know, people by people. And spending time with individuals to grow things you know i've heard him speaking he's a remarkable guy and the third is is how to do a consultation how to do ethical uh, comprehensive dentistry so we have photography we have um, chats on finance we have chats on treatment planning um, over two days in the third module and the fourth module is financial intelligence so setting you up with a power team of, of um, accountants lawyers uh, marketing people as well as understanding how to grow a portfolio of practices. So we have 10 um, guests that come in on those two days um, for short bursts to, to fill you in. So look, anything like that, we had 50 applicants for the 12 places that have just been sold out um, for this year. Um, but we are, if you look at the website, elitedentalleaders.com, you'll see um, there's an application form on there. And I think for anybody that's ambitious and wants the correct way to do things, in this collaborative approach that we're in, I'm trying to put together cohorts on a yearly basis. Um, that will then work together in years to come as a group, because I think the teamship and um, in, it can be in dentistry, although we work individually, we, we can work together. Um, and obviously my background is through professional sport, but I, I think it's really simple that that we can work together better. And, and so um, that's where the inc incision of this came from. 
Um, so if you're interested, Peter, you know, have a look at that website. Very good. Could you repeat the website again for it's us? Uh, World Wide Web, EliteDentalLeaders.com. Yeah. All one word, EliteDentalLeaders.com. Elite Dental Leaders. Thanks, Samir. That's excellent. And, you know, as well, alongside that program, one of the one of the um, experiences I've had personally, and I'm sure you've had the same, is when, when you get around, <clears throat> when you spend time with people who are on a development journey, a growth journey, people who are into leadership, people who want to drive higher levels of results, you normalize a different level of performance. And, if, and from what you've described and from, you know, we've discussed it, your program is not only going to give people that that kind of competence, training, mentorship, but they'll, they'll become part of this high-performing community that just normalizes the next level. And that that is so important to start thinking differently about yourself and the people that you spend time with. So really good. Thank, thanks, Samir. Appreciate it. Um, Sandy, how about you? Yeah, so you know, we as you as you mentioned, uh, Justin, we have covered most of the stuff, and mm. we, we the most important thing is, you know, if you're just starting out, going on a day training course or something like that is not going to get you ready for it. As Samir mentioned, that what he's doing is a 12, 12 months, twelve months training program. You need to you need to have you need to get that knowledge under your belt before you can go away, and you know it. It's an investment. Again, like I mentioned that before as well. When you go out and doing something like that, it's an investment which pays off or pays off over time. Mm. Again, if you can have somebody's number in your contact list in your phone, is you know, just sense check. You know, I'm running my small network, which we talk, talked about. Uh, 90 or practices, the principles who run run it. They just simply, you know, they are very successfully running their dental practices, but they simply pick up a phone and, you know, sometimes they ask me, Sandeep, I'm stuck with this decision here. What do you think I should do? You know, how do I structure this lease? How do I structure, how do I pay my associate? How do I hire this staff member? And all they have got me is on a speed dial. And they pick up a phone and, you know, it's just sometimes I have an answer there. And then sometimes I tell them that, you know, Give me some time and I'll, I'll I'll think about it. And it's nothing, you know. It's 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 about being on the on the ground and 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 doing it. Mm. So this is what you know the with the my small network with which I do. And I think most important thing is decide what do you want to do. It's mm. all about making those decisions and having somebody putting a hand on your shoulder to say it's okay. I'm here for you and I'm happy to help you help you on 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 this uh, on this journey. So you know. We run this uh, uh, program called My Smile Academy, which is starting on 1st of October, our third cohort. And that's all it is about. You know, people have questions of how do I set up systems and processes? How do I set up patient journey? What sort of technology I integrate? How do I do this? How do I do that? It's a very simple three months course. And at the end of three months, you'll know everything what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's. It's about having mentors. You know, looking back, I, I remember, and I think you'll, you'll speak to any anybody who has uh, done well. Um, and even today's date, you know, I have got a my coach on a speed dial. Thanks, so, mate. I mean, like, you don't need to tell him that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. I've got to tell you that. So I've got to tell everybody. <laughs> How many times I bother you, Justin? <laughs> Listen, just a quickie on that. Sorry, to, uh, sorry, Sandy, I it. So, you, you know, the, the thing about mentor, it, or, or, it's just you don't want to make many mistakes because you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. And actually, the, the mentor that you have, or whoever you feel comfortable with, whatever it is, it's all about actually not making those mistakes mm -hmm. because the mistakes just drop you back down again, whether it be confidence or financial or whatever it is. What we want to do is just keep you growing up. And, and, you know, whoever it is around you, and I'm sure that there might be somebody from university who works around you uh, or somebody you aspire to be like, just ring them up. And, you, you know, um, more than ever, what a great time to, to ask for help. And, and you know, we, we have time in, 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 in the world now. Mm. I, that's great. And, and interestingly, um, Sheetal has asked about some advice for choosing mentors. I think you've answered it. Uh, but is there anything else in terms of uh, kind of thinking about how you identify mentors? You said 
Samir, you know, choose someone who is in a position that, you know, you admire, you want to emulate, right? And that is is potentially a good fit for you. Make sure, But you also said earlier, make sure that there's a connection, make sure you get on because that's important. Sometimes I know you both um, are running programs and providing that support to people on your program. So potentially find a program that you're interested in with somebody that's leading it that could potentially be a mentor throughout that period. Uh, anything else that, that kind of comes to mind? Can I just add something here? You know, mm. don't, don't hesitate. If you, what we do is, you know, we find out who you want to emulate, who you think is the person who can help you. Yeah. And trust me, successful people are always willing to help. Mm. Reach they out, help. Help. Yeah. Find them through Facebook, find them through Instagram, find them through whichever way you can. And just a quick message, hey, you know, I get people all the time, hey, Sandeep, I'm visiting Birmingham, do you mind if I can come and uh, have a look at your My Small Clinic in City Centre? And those people, there's a number of times it has happened, some of them has become part of the network and some decided not to, and that's okay. So if, you know, I, I think I shared my details with you at the start, honest to God, if any of you got, guys, any questions, Forget about everything else. I am more than happy to support you and help you and answer any question offline, out of air, and reach out to those people. You know, there's a lots of successful people out there. If you want to learn leadership, you want to learn Invisalign, you want to learn dental implants, facial aesthetics, there's somebody who has already been through that journey. Reach out to them, and you will be very, very pleasantly surprised how many people are out there who are who are willing to help and willing to share their knowledge mm. so take that take that next step very good and very generous offer of you thank you sandy M much appreciated i'm sure by our listeners as well um so uh, let me i've got a question that uh, i think might be useful uh so I i'd love to hear about key challenges you've faced along the way you know it, we all have difficult periods in our careers and, and i'm sure you have both had the same but is there, I'd love to think of the one kind of point in your career or your journey so far where you perhaps thought, you know, this isn't working or I'm not going to make this. And then whatever whatever action you took, you were able to turn that around, get yourself back on track and almost kind of uh, brave, brave the situation and, and succeed against the odds. I'd love to hear if, your perspective on that. Um, Samir, perhaps you first, if you've got uh, if you've got something. Oh, I, I just hate losing. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, let's start with that. I need to put myself away for a few days and just have a good look at myself in the mirror and, and come back if I've lost. But no, it's it's one thing that that sport has taught me that you know if you lose, obviously, yeah, fair enough, you lost. But fi figure out how you're going to get better the next time you go again. Yeah, and so um, you, you, you know, there's no losers because you know I'm really not hard on myself. If something doesn't go quite right, okay, well, it, it didn't go quite right today, and how can I make sure it doesn't go the same again? That would be a big thing for me. Um, but I think there's constant, constant, just not quite right. And as soon if you assume that it's just not going to be right, and we're going to just chat, the chat, have that challenge in front of you, and we're then going to go above it every time. I think that's just a, a mindset thing. So I think your mindset has got to be um, really positive and there will be challenges on this journey. And the challenges will allow me to really think deep about which direction to sail the boat in. Um, and it may not be that the final destination that you put in the map is where you end up because things may change and you know, the, the wind may change and, you know, orthodontics, well, we're lucky with 11 orthodontics. It became, orthodontics is massive. Mm. So, yeah, obviously there's a spot of luck in there, but we've harnessed that wind and, and then gone in, in a specific direction. So I just think the whole journey, if you make it fun and make it a game, you won't be hard on yourself. And there'll, de there'll be days you win and there'll be days you lose. And therefore you just realize, okay, well, it was another day but don't make the same mistakes so you can carry on getting higher and higher and higher and higher and that growth will just be there. So are there difficult days? Of course they're difficult days. And then those days I just focus on the other things around me, whether it be my family, my health, eating well, um, friendships, and I know that it's just going to come back around and it's, it's going to be okay because it's going to be okay. It's not the, if it's not the end, it's not okay. 
Mm, I love that. Yeah, I love that quote. And it brings us back to, you know, the introduction, Samir, where I quoted you, excellence is a process and not a destination, right? Yeah, and it still isn't the destination. You, you know, we're still continuing to grow, learn new things and challenge ourselves. Uh, and, you know, we should be trying to do something new every day and trying to, to grow ourselves. You know, knowledge is just an addition of something we didn't know, adding it to something we knew, right? Mm. And that happens every day. And that that's growth and knowledge. And so let's continue to do that. And, and in business, you always do that because you're always set with challenges on a daily basis. You know, I, I have a mantra that if I don't set, if I solve 150 problems in a day, that's a normal day for me. <laughs> if, it's, if, it's le if it's less, it's an easy day. If it's more, it's I've had a tough day. <laughs> Love that. Love that. It gives you a barometer. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's an easy day today, man. Easy day. Oh, tough day today. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Yeah, sir. I mean, that can be for like patient problems. It can be things that didn't quite work at the practice or something was a problem. You, you know, I, I sort of mean that in the nicest possible way, but we are just natural good problem solvers as dentists. So, you know, you know when you run your business, you're going to be faced with problems. And so I think a big thing that we talk about is mentorship. And therefore, having somebody you can just ring and say before you make the mistake, yeah. getting it right. Because, you, you know, success is built on not too many failures, actually. It's mm. not built on so many. You, you know, you want consistency. You don't want intensity. Mm. Yeah, it's great. Small step, small step, small step and less mistakes. And, and you know, it's also being realistic about what you're facing as, as a practice owner. Because if you if you're not anticipating or prepared for dealing with problems, they're going to keep coming at you and you probably end up being worn down by them. But if part of the way that you approach the business is to recognise problems are going to come at us every day and I'm my job, as well as being a clinician, as well as running the business, as well as being a leader, as well as all the other things that you have to do, is, is solving problems and making sure that we navigate through them as, as effectively as possible. And sometimes that's with support from a mentor. Sometimes it's figuring it out as you go along. Yeah, really yeah, I'm going to share a quick story with you when we took over 11. And, and mm. so there was the previous associates there and they were leaving after a year. And it's all come towards the end of the year. And we were then running it ourselves. And um, and we had four staff and they really didn't want to come on the boat in the direction we wanted to go in. And so I came in one day and I asked HR to come in and we sacked three of them. So we had one staff. On one day, we sacked three staff. Wow. We had one member, and that member was shaking all day, thinking, like, what's going to happen to me? So I went to see her, and I said, look, you know, you're really following us. You're very supportive. And then that was the day that I would say 11 Dental was created because it was our ship, our way, our direction, and everybody then was pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So actually, sometimes you do need to do major things that are totally out of comfort zone and totally don't feel right but if it's not right it's not right and one bad egg really can spoil a dental practice can spoil a cricket team can spoil um a, a, any type of relationship so i would say just identify good people keep them on your bus and um and share the vision as sandeep has said um for these people and you know in, in the, talk to them individually about what their roles and 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 define what their role is and what, what they are expecting from them. Mm. Brave decision, Samir. A, a necessary decision, but brave decision. Very, very difficult. Those you know those key moments of leadership are so important for us to to embrace, however uncomfortable we feel. Yeah, you can imagine how difficult that was, Justin, yeah. for the next six months or three months or whatever it was until. Mm. We could get the next load in and you know temps and all the rest of it but we just knew the, you know we had to bounce and we had to get to the bottom and then we had to move forward and sometimes actually that were that that i look back on that day and saying that was the day yeah. that was the day we really started to move in the direction we wanted to move in very good great that you can look back and see that you know critical decision critical decision point and the impact it then had really good Really good. Uh, so, Sandy, how about you? Key challenge and, and kind of how you navigated and, and got through it. Let me tell you a story. I think that will probably summarize the whole thing. <laughs> so 2010, I opened a clinic in House of Fraser, Birmingham. So 2007, I opened a clinic in Birmingham City Center, and then that did really, really well. I was on a roll, so I opened a clinic in House of Fraser, Birmingham in 2010. Did phenomenally well. Uh, 
that that time we were doing about 300 three four hundred cases of Invisalign in my in my practices and that was in a row right you know we wasted we know what to do now and that you know that cockiness comes in Mm. Um, so there was a house of Fraser, Solihull, which is about 25 miles away from Birmingham. Uh, so right, let's, let's go there. So, you know, house of Fraser was loving it, the revenue we were generating and the business we were bringing. So we went in house of Fraser, Solihull. So we opened a clinic in house of Fraser, Solihull in 2012. So within two years, we went there for whatever reason, uh, people who know this area, Solihull is a little bit different demographic compared to Birmingham. All right, mate. It's a little bit different there. You know. <laughs> it's not quite right, and he's. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. So you know all this Google and social media and all this thing which we which we mastered in Birmingham. Just none of that worked in Solihull. What do you do? So we have invested all the money setting up a squad practice, bought all the equipments, everything was there, but whatever we were doing, it was not working. So we had to do like minimum hundred cases to even break even. And we were not going anywhere near. Sat down with the team. Right, so we're going to do one final push. And if we can get 20 cases out of that this month, we're going to stay. Otherwise, we're going to have to think about this. We did everything through a lot of money. It still didn't work. And then we made the best out of that situation. So I had a chat with House of Fraser. We decided to move to House of Fraser, Manchester. So we took all the equipments and cabinetries and everything. So we lost a little bit of money with the, you know, setting up the building site and everything, but made the best out of it, whatever we had, moved everything to Manchester within, by the end of year one, we were profitable. So, you know, initially we were talking about the location site. This is where my biggest failure was. You know, there are very successful dental practices in Solihull, don't get me wrong, but it was not for me. But whereas we got the location right in Manchester, so there was a big challenge, you know, I could have just sat there and that would have really damaged my confidence that, you know, messed it up, it's not mm-hmm. working, what the hell I've done, well, we looked at that situation, what's the best. So when something goes wrong, just take a pause, just step away from everything, bring your key team members, sit, sit down with them and say, you know, what is the lesson here? And mm-hmm. if you learn from that, that will pay off in long time so Mm -hmm. here you go i hope that uh, that answers your question justin (laughs) very good there you go i don't think i've ever shared this before but why not it's 8 30. (laughs) (laughs) thank you thank you uh sandy thank you samir and we've got some great comments um you know ravi ravi solanke saying love the honesty and experience and humility of you both thank you so much for sharing Uh, and it is really you know it's really valuable for people to hear the challenges you've faced, the way that you've overcome them. Sometimes we don't always feel like there's an end in sight, but that ability to persevere, stop, reflect, pause, take some time, reconsider, make some changes. That's such an important part of running a successful business, isn't it? It's it's only going to happen if you can do that. Um, Got some great, uh, some great uh, uh, comments Irina saying thank you very much you've got some great ideas based on what you've said so thank you guys very very much um we've got a couple of other questions uh Michael Donald says what do you think the next big breakthrough is going to be in dentistry hmm, that's interesting isn't it next big breakthrough Samir what do you think gosh um look I I, I think this digital age is coming to the fore basically um and and so i think you know it's going to be in that direction um, yeah you know i was asked recently the same question and, and i said you, you know what we've had a big jump recently in the last 10 years in terms of digital movement and i think um the next step for us will be oh, gosh I can't, I can't even think but things are becoming guided um a little bit more um controlled um no, I just think the continuation of the digital movement will be there, and and I think you know we should all we should all be part of that. And if you if you're left behind with that to some degree, I think um, patients will see you as a little bit more older fashioned. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I can't see any brand new stuff that's going to come on the market. We're not going to grow new teeth. We're not, you know, we're not going to have drill. We're not going to lose the drill. Um, but I think we're actually making dentistry a lot nicer. Um, mm. 
and so therefore the experience is better you, you, you know we've all had patients that have hated going to the dentist they come in so fearful you know and i'm still wet-handed i'm still enjoying dentistry and they come in and, and, and they find it really tough um and, and it's great when you can turn them around but at the same time um i think dentistry is is in a great place you, you know it, um, there's so many great clinicians out there um, we're all ethically moving in the right direction um, and and you know there is there is some great aesthetic work we can do to to help change people's lives as well so I, I think you know our profession is in a great place but movement quickly from a technology point of view i think it's got to be all digital based mm. yeah great uh, great summary samir i completely agree uh, sandy what what about you uh, you know, I hate to say it, but uh, the reality is all these DIY companies, you know, DIY aligners and this and that, it, it's, we all know it's not ethical, we all know it's not right, mm -hmm. but reality is there are consumers who are liking that type of concept. That's why, you know, there is a new aligner DIY company popping up left, right and centers. Mm -hmm. uh, do they have a future? I think yes. Will they ever take overtake what dentists do? Never ever. Uh, so just to give an example, you know, we've got a uh, small dad club in Manchester and in Birmingham, very close to our practices. They are there. It's, it's a very, it's a very worthy competitor. We need to keep an eye on them, what they are doing, but mm -hmm. do we need to worry and be scared of that, that, you know, one day all the business will go to them. I'm not, but I think, uh, it's best to keep an eye on them and what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, other thing I see is big corporates are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, big corporates are in a lot of competition with each other and they are swallowing small corporates and single-handed practices. Um, and they are really are competing with each other to buy the best practices out there. So five years down the line, I think 60 to 80 percent of the practices will be owned by corporates 20 percent of the practices will be owned by a successful individuals who are business savvy they know what they are doing uh what else i see i see um you know i go to lots of practices part of part of the my small network you know i go into practices speak to the members the successful ones are really adapted to things one is the digital and second is the system and processes Mm. And they have, you know, they are not dependent on the dentist to do the work. Dentist has become a part of the team instead of sitting up at the at the hierarchy of the of the team that everything have to filter through that. That every team member is so people who adapt this philosophy, in my opinion, those those practices will succeed in 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 in, in years down the line. Mm. That's the three mm. three things which I think. Will, will define the direction of uh, mm. direction of the dentist. Very, very interesting insights. Thanks, Sandeep. And, you know, we've talked about this uh, not only one-to-one, uh, -one, but in some of the groups that we work with. You know, this ability of uh, independent practitioners and, and practice teams to be able to articulate the value, ask the patient the right questions, to be able to really kind of understand how do I differentiate myself from a you know direct to patient offering it's so important that's not something you can convey on a just solely through your you know marketing and through your website you've got to be able to have a consultative conversation with a patient so that you can understand what they're really looking for and match what you deliver to their needs and you've got to be able to have that communication that impactful communication so so important Yes, great. Thank you. Guys, uh, we are at quarter to nine, I, I, and I really, really am so grateful for your investment of time this evening. Before we close our session, is there is there a question I haven't asked either of you that you would you, you wish I had? And if so, what is it? And uh, please, you know, feel free to, to share maybe an insight you, you really want to share with people listening. It may be something that you just think is important as a message. I'd, I'd love for you to share something. So, Samir, I'll, I'll ask you first, please. Um, I, I think it's it's really important to keep growing, to have a growth mindset. And um, whether you're an associate, whether you're a practice um, leader, or or you're a practice manager, or or in the team, just have a growth mindset. Always want to improve yourself, um, and, and or improve your practice. Because actually, when you plateau, 
actually that's when the dead wood starts to kick in whether it be mentally or within the way you work um, so keep enjoying what you're doing um, but that only comes with a growth mindset so if you're at your plateau uh, it's where where we call the thinking time before you go again make your three points make your three action points and go again and keep growing um, so I, I you know that would that be the only thing that I would say um, I'd like to share with everybody else mm. out there that have a growth mindset and keep growing yourself. So important. Thanks, Samir. G- great, great message uh, to finish on. Thank you so much. Excellent. Um, Sandeep. Um, the final comment I can add is, you know, I'm sure some of you guys must have heard about Seth Godin. Seth Godin is a marketing guru. Mm. As soon as his book comes out, I'm the first one to buy. I don't think I've left any of his book, which I've not read about three times. Uh, one of the book I read about from him was called Purple Cow. And that really means is be remarkable, be different. Why you? Consumers are choosing. There were lots of choices. They don't have any patience. Why you? What are you giving there in the marketplace? You know, when it comes to I am mentoring people on Invisalign, why people join my small network, why people join my small academy, why patient comes to my clinic, why... So always focus on if you're just going to be another practice like on the corner, but if you're going to start doing the same thing, you know, good luck. Yes, you will. You will have some patience, but you're not going to become remarkable. So always think about learn from everybody. Go away and come up with your own ideas. Success. You will never be successful following somebody else's footstep. You can learn from them, but you have to carve out your own pathway. And that is the only way. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Samir. Uh, It's a final thing from me, as well as a a thank you to you both for uh, your generosity this evening, not only your time, but your your advice, sharing your experiences uh, and being so open and authentic. I really appreciate it. We've had some great comments on the chat. We didn't get to every question, but I think we got to uh, to the majority. Uh, a few comments on here from people just saying thanks so much for everything. They've really, really gained a lot of value. Um, and, and people saying great to see the, the kind of faces behind some of the big brands and the big names in dentistry they know. So thank you both very much. Uh, I just want to share with people on our webinar that we have a free digital goodie bag for everybody that's joined us. And Basically, in that goodie bag, there's a plethora of gifts. So all you have to do is use this link at the bottom. It's bit.ly, which is B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash goodie with an I-E hyphen bag. And you can you can access this content. All you need to do is register your details and then you can access the content. And we've got some incredible offers from partners of um, our webinar and partners of Focus of Growth in our businesses. Uh, I say a huge thank you to Sandy. If anybody has enjoyed listening about the my smile academy this evening and thinks they'd like to try it uh, the next cohort starts on the 1st of october there aren't very many places left but sandy it was very generously offered us a 100 pound discount if you wanted to start that next program it's a 12 week program 100 pound discount all you do is register your details follow the link and you'll be able to see that that promotion so thank you so much sandy But in your free digital goodie bag, you'll also get a a copy of my best-selling book, The Inspire Influence Sell. Mark Topley has very generously uh, given us a copy of his CSR Advantage book, which is newly launched. Uh, David Horn has given us a copy of his Add Then Multiply, How Do You Scale and Think About Your Business and Think About an Exit Strategy, which is quite an interesting concept beyond just dentistry. Uh, Daniel Priestley, who is a multiple award-winning author, has donated two books for our digital goodie bag, Key Person of Influence and 24 Assets, both about entrepreneurship and how we develop scalable businesses. And then two other uh, partners of ours, the um, Exceptional Leadership Academy, Nikki Rowland and her team have offered one month free uh, enrollment in their platform and their program. So thank you, Nikki. And the guys at Sublime Trading, who work with a lot of dentists in kind of compounding wealth over investment strategies and programs have donated a free video based program as well. So you can get all of that free of charge simply by registering your details with the digital goodie bag. And that will be confirmed also in the follow up note from Dentistry Magazine to everybody. So it just remains for me to say thank you again to Samir and Sandeep. Thank you to everybody for tuning in for your questions. 
and really, really enjoyable conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and learned as much as we have as well. So, guys, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you both soon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Justin. Good, Justin. You, and Samir, good to share the stage with you, buddy. Yeah, sure always we'll, good. we'll catch each other soon, yeah? Sure, Excellent. Sure. Cheers. Thank, thank you. you both. Have a great evening. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Yes, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.